Thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, welcome to the Methods in Sinology lecture series on the Chinese history of science. So this lecture series um, aims to introduce research practices in different subfields of sinology. Um, in modern times, we think it's increasingly easy to get hold of data and research results, but a large part of what goes into doing research remains hidden. How do sinologists come up with research questions? How do they evaluate primary sources? And what do they pay attention to? What choices uh, do they have to make when translating a text? So the goal of methods in sinology is to organize a virtual space where such tacit knowledge will be shared. Um, the Methods in Sinology project was founded by Mariana Zorkina and Madalena Poli, and is now, um, who are here today, or some, some of whom are here today, and is now co-organized by a team of volunteers, which includes myself, Henry Jacobs, and Marcus Hasselbeck. Um, so today, of course, uh, today's speaker needs little introduction. Uh, professor Joachim Kurtz is a professor of intellectual history in Chinese at the University of Heidelberg. Prior to joining the Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies, Professor Kurtz worked as an associate professor of Chinese at Emory University and a research group director at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Professor Kurtz has also held numerous visiting positions, including the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris, and the Institute for History and Philology at Academia Sinica in Taipei. Professor Kurtz's research focuses on cultural and scientific exchanges between China, Japan, and Europe, with a special emphasis on logic, philosophy, political theory, translation studies, and the history of the book. And among his uh, voluminous publications there are, of course, the discovery of Chinese logic and eight edited volumes, including new terms for new ideas and standards of validity in late imperial China. So um, without further ado, Professor Kurtz, we're delighted uh, to have you today. Um, and I hand over the floor to you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much and, and welcome everyone. I'm, I'm greatly honored, of course, by this um, invitation. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful initiative sort of for all of us to reflect back um, and forth uh, about the different methods that we use in our work. Um, I was a bit surprised to get the invitation, I have to say, um, because I'm not quite a historian of science, as, as some of you may know. Sort of I'm trained as a sinologist, I have a background in, in philosophy and political theory, and now I have a chair that is called intellectual history, and I interpret that as broadly conceived the history of knowledge. So um, I, I will try sort of to um, sell myself as a historian of science, but if it's not right up the alley of most of you, I, I apologize in advance, and I'll try to make it worth your while um, nonetheless. Um, so I, I had these two talks to give, and I, I thought it's sort of um, a good opportunity to look back at what I'd done before, which is related to the history of science, namely working on the discovery of Chinese logic, and then also look ahead um, um, and sort of take stock of, of what we did with a couple of colleagues. I, I see Ari Levine in the audience who with, was one of my co-editors for the Standards of Validity volume. So we can think about what we do um, in the future next week. But, but today what I want to do... Um, and I have to see how I can change my slides, hang on, like that, is the following. Um, I, I will introduce um, a problem about Chinese logic, and I will illustrate that with a tripod, a tripod of civilizations. Then I will I'll take a cold, hard look at what we have as material to work with in ancient Chinese logic. Uh, and then I'll do some reflections on how we can perhaps best reconstruct a reconstruction, because that's what everything that we know about Chinese logic as Chinese not logic um, is today. Once I did that, I will visit some of the themes that I um, addressed in a book called The Discovery of Chinese Logic, um, but only very, very briefly and very, very selectively. Um, and then I'll go on basically to tell the story um, what happened after I end my book. Um, and next week, I'll say something about where I think we may take the investigation of Chinese logic. So it won't be all about the Mo Jing and the Gong Sun Long. Um, it will be more a story about how to deal with these texts and, and what to do with these texts. Now, um, to illustrate the problem, um, I, I thought we can look at this um, tripod, the Ding, um, in classical Chinese. And it's very often used as an illustration that, um, that globally now, um, there are basically three major traditions of formal logic, namely um, in Greece, in India, and in China. 
And, and that's a story that, that you find, you know, if you go to say Wikipedia, sort of oh, <laughs> our first stop, we say formal logic developed in ancient times in India, China, um, and Greece, and it's all over the place. Um, sometimes um, a bit more is said about this ding, about this tripod, uh, for instance, by Cui Tingtian, who was um, someone working at Nankai University and the great historian of Chinese logic, he says, well, in the international history of logic, we find these three traditions, the Greek, the Indian, and the Chinese. These traditions have similarities as well as particularities. They all proceed, that's the claim, from the same basic contents, and all of them develop specific forms of inferences. And then in order to understand uh, um, the differences between them, we have to look into the social conditions and the cultural backgrounds where they emerge. So that's a that's a very typical view of, of what we know now as these three logical traditions. But what I found surprising when I started working on this topic is how recent this understanding is about the three um, um, logical traditions. So many people claimed, um, and I have, um, hang on, I have one example, um, uh, which is clearly um, a, a bit strange from um, a, a tabloid newspaper, the New York Tribune, published on the 2nd of July of 1900. And there they say, the task of one who would write of Chinese logic is as simple as that of the author of the famous essay on snakes in Ireland. There is no logic as a science in China and very little of the ordinary everyday logic of other civilizations. Not only do the Chinese lack the syllogism, the laws of thought, and the whole system of reasoning as built up by European minds, but they show in their daily life a strange lack of the power of induction. To this lack, we may justly be ascribed the curiously undeveloped condition of their civilization. Now, of course, you will say that is a clearly, you know, racist, imperialist trope, um, uh, full of um, 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 Western hypocrisy uh, and other things that I agree with you. But what is surprising is that this was a view that was, uh, it was held by many people uh, and not only in the West. So, of course, one other further um, expression of the same thing um, goes back to Matteo Ricci, who was someone who held great esteem of traditional Chinese scholarship, but he says that there's one lack that it has. Chinese scholarship, Matteo Ricci writes in his journals, has no conceptions of the rules of logic. It knows nothing of dialectic. And he says that although he was aware of texts like the Gongsun Lung and others um, that he had read before. Once again, that's a Westerner and you could say, well, yeah, what do they know? Um, but here's a list of people, a litany of people um, from China who basically said the same thing. So you have Liang Qichao, and we'll encounter him later, uh, holding a very different position just two years later. Um, he says, the lack of logic is the single most consequential weakness of Chinese philosophical thinking. He says that in 1902. Wang Wei, and we'll also encounter him again, holding a different position in 1905, um, says, uh, China has always had debates. So we were fighting over things, but we have never known logic. And even someone as sort of um, um, nationalistic, you would say, as uh, Xiong Shili and as proud of Chinese um, philosophy and culture said, because Chinese philosophy emphasizes intuitive uh, perception, it does not care about logic. The few things we find written about logic are utterly unsystematic. So this is a very um, harsh view uh, of what there is in Chinese logic. And so therefore you think, well, how did it come about that from, from this position, we move to the position that China has always had logic, 2,500 years of history, and it's one of the three great logical traditions. Now, um, uh, first of all, I think what we need to do when, when looking or thinking about this problem is we have to take stock of what's out there, right? So we have a look of what we find. Um, and, and that's what I um, started out doing. So all of us, I think by now have a, an image close to what I, I will repeat now of what Chinese logic is. So uh, we know that discussions of logical problems can be traced back um, to the 5th century BC, to people like Deng Xi, um, and, and, and then um, later the Gongsun Nong, and, and, and all these other people um, that we have come to understand as the dialecticians, the debaters, um, who were later classified as a distinct school of names. Um, but of course, um, other schools of ancient Chinese philosophy, um, Xunzi is among them, um, but also Han Feizi, also talked about uh, problems of names, um, or of names and realities. Um, so there was clearly something there, um, which Matteo Ricci didn't recognize, which Liang Qichao didn't take seriously, which Wang Wei didn't like, and which Xiong Shi Li found unsystematic. Maybe one of the problems was that the, the body of extant texts that we have documenting Chinese uh, logic from that uh, period is fragmentary and is very, very slim. Um, I, I once copied together all the <laughs> excerpts that were labeled as um, Chinese theories of logic, um, and it came out as about 10 A4 pages. 
Um, so that's not too much, right? It's not a whole chapter of Plato's Republic or, or something like that. It's even less than that. And it takes a lot of interpretation to find it. Nevertheless, um, um, the story goes on. So we have this in ancient China, pre qin Chinese logic. Um, then uh, the standard story goes that interest in logic and debate uh, receded or broke down following the unification of the empire um, and the ideological stratification that happened next. So Wang Guowei basically said, you know, um, with the unification of the empire and the uh, canonization of the Confucian classics, um, Chinese philosophy um, came to a, a halt, a grinding halt, and only now in the 20th century can we start um, to think about it again. Now, that was certainly too harsh a view. Uh, we know that some of the texts from the pre teen period were continue, or continued to be read, um, and we have another high point, a brief high point, of Chinese logical thinking between the third and fourth century CE um, in schools like the so-called uh, school of dark learning, the Xuanxue, um, that practiced debate um, competitions at royal courts. So there was another uh, brief flowering of, of Chinese logic, but many of the texts that were uh, around or that must have been around, prefaces to the Mo Jing among them, um, were later lost, sadly. Um, then the story goes on that we have a new wave of, of interest in logic from an entirely different source. So that starts um, in the 7th and 8th century CE with the translation of uh, rules of reasoning from India. So there we have um, a coming in um, of texts that, that are much more voluminous than anything we have from ancient China that try to spell out especially fallacies of reasoning and give you some rules of how to avoid fallacies and point them out uh, among your opponents. These were then systematized, and I, I'm sure you all know that in this uh, so-called knowledge of reasons, um, in Ming in Chinese, that circulated in and around Buddhist monasteries um, in systematic treatises until about 1200 AD. Um, but it was mainly restricted to Buddhist thought. What I found interesting when looking into that was that um, hardly anyone working on Buddhist forms of logic immediately made the link back to the Mo Jing, to the Gongsun Long, to um, uh, Hui Shi, to the paradoxes that we find in the Zhuangzi, or to any of the other texts. Rather, they said it's something completely different and has nothing to do with that. And we find a similar um, disturbing thought that when the first traces of European logic came to China, no one for a very long time, and specifically until 1897, so I, we can date that very, very uh, clearly, or 18, um, 1898, even if you want to have um, a, an essay about the topic, um, that there are any obvious equivalents between what the Europeans were selling uh, as an indispensable science and what Chinese scholars had in their own heritage. So there was just a complete mismatch. They said, we don't have anything of that, we don't need it, um, and we never wanted it. So that's basically the, the starting point from, from which I operated. And so if you think about this, this thing, again, this, this tripod, um, it, it looks that, you know, by the time I started working on the topic, it looked more like that. So it was not a, a pretty tripod with three sturdy legs that were all of equal length and, and could carry the whole thing. And I, I, I'm grateful to my colleague, Enno Gile, who's, you know, who, who took this photo when being on a dig um, in China. So this is what we had. And, and the problem that I wanted to address in my work was basically how we managed to go from this image of what we have, sort of a tripod with one leg that is not like the others, and not in the best shape, um, to this image that we have now of a beautiful balanced um, 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 a ding, a tripod of global civilizations. So that was basically uh, what I set out to do. And I wanted to understand this transition, how this reconstruction of Chinese logic from the ding with one broken leg, with clearly it had a leg, but it was too short and it didn't carry much. And it was never used throughout Chinese tradition um, until the, the late 19th century, um, how it came to that. So I needed to answer the question and that's the method part. So I'm finally coming to the method part. How can we reconstruct what is clearly a reconstruction? Um, and I started looking out sort of in, into different books that could maybe help me. So I, I of course started with uh, looking into um, histories of logic. So clearly that would have been a starting point. I, I, I hoped to basically learn how can we um, understand how ancient Greek logic has now informed um, maybe later periods or something like that. Um, but I found that histories of logic are not terribly helpful in that. Most of them are written in a very Whiggish um, form. They're problem histories. What are the most important problems of logic that interest us until today? What did the ancients perhaps contribute? Where did they go wrong? Um, and how can we improve upon them? 
So I looked into um, everything that was around. Um, Neil and Neil was sort of one of the classics that was used when I, I studied logic. Um, then um, Buchensky um, was a Jesuit logician, and at least he uh, expanded the scope of his history of formal logic to India, but he basically completely neglected China. So there was nothing that I could find there. Now, what would have been other sources to look at our inspirations to look at how to study this problem of how to reconstruct a reconstruction? Um, when I was young, um, none of you might remember that, um, very much so this archaeology of knowledge um, with Foucault uh, was there that you basically, so if you had to dig up and you had to trace how um, things emerge as objects of knowledge and what you could do with that. So that was one inspiration that was in the background, but I was never too fond of Foucault. Uh, another thing, and I also saw Ivo Amelung sort of um, digging in, um, is basically this very German practice of conceptual history. I, I fear sort of um, um, an English volume. It was basically a, an attempt to understand how lexical changes were indicators of conceptual changes and how through these conceptual changes sort of new objects of knowledge um, came about. And there was something that we found um, for a while very inspiring, especially when we were working on a project together on the translation of the modern sciences into Chinese and Japanese and try to reconstruct the languages in which um, these were verbalized. Um, so this was a bit closer to what later I, I also uh, found. Um, and the third inspiration is, and that's the history of science part, finally, um, is uh, this um, thing that sometimes um, people in Berlin claim to have invented, which is not true, it comes from France, um, namely this idea of um, a historical epistemology. Now, so a historical epistemology in opposition to um, philosophical epistemology answers a different question. So epistemology in general can be described, and here's Hans-Jörg Reinberger has a beautiful introduction to the whole field. And he says sort of an epistemology is a theory of knowledge that inquires what it is that makes knowledge scientific, what turns it into justified true belief. That's one way of doing epistemology. But historical epistemology does something different. Historical epistemology is a theory that reflects on the historical conditions under which and the means with which things are made into objects of knowledge. And that was something that I, find immediately, that I found immediately appealing. I mean, how can we explain that these texts, like the Mojing, like the Gong Sun Long and others, became an object of knowledge and were understood in the terms of modern logic? How did that transition came about? Um, what were the benefits? What were the gains that we made from that? And what could have been potential losses of you know, turning them into logical fragments. Um, so, so that's the history of science background. Of course, sort of um, exemplary studies for that. Um, and I apologize sort of to have the original language sources there. Ludwig Fleck, um, it's sort of, it's the, 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 the genesis and development of a scientific fact, of course, a classic in the field of historical um, 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 epistemology and also in the history of science. Um, that was a book that I found um, very, very appealing because it basically tells you the story of how a, a certain disease became a, a category of medical inquiry. Um, and Ludwig Fleck, sort of who, who was a doctor, a bacteriologist, um, um, did that in his spare time. And, and what he shows, sort of in, in addition to all these uh, theoretical um, insights that he has in this book, and there's many of them, is that it's actually a lot of fun to think about these things. So they, we have accounts that Fleck was getting together with a lot of friends at night, um, writing this book together, and they were laughing themselves silly because they said this will so annoy um, our me medical colleagues when we tell them that their knowledge is actually historically and socially situated and it's not um, natural what they believe about certain disease categories they have a history and this history needs to be reconstructed and it re is, is reconstructed as a contingent and very messy process so i liked that a lot and i thought you know if i could do something like that that you know i'd be done and uh, i'd be great a another uh, inspiration that none of you will know uh, and you don't have to uh, it comes from a tradition, a very German tradition of, of writing disciplinary histories um, that goes back sort of to the 70s. Uh, and, and I was fortunate that um, two historians of logic were big names in the field, Christian Thiel and Volker Peckhaus, who, who worked in Erlangen, where Ivo Amlung and I also worked. Um, and they had um, um, developed sort of um, tools to reconstruct um, the history of scientific disciplines, especially of their own discipline of logic. And they were mainly working uh, on um, Polish traditions of logic. And Poland was one of the leading countries of modern mathematical logic. So um, the work they did in that field, um, I thought, uh, was very, very inspiring. So these are the things that I had in the background. Then the question is, of course, so how do I tell my story? Um, at first, 
I, I thought I'd do something really grand. And I, I think maybe many PhD students have that in the back of their heads that they do sort of, they write the big book uh, about the topic. So, so two that I, I liked and would have liked to emulate if I were able to, uh, you know, one, of course, for, for, you know, for some of you are situated in Harvard, uh, of course, you know, Daston and Gallison's um, objectivity, that's the regulative idea, the ideal that you will never reach in telling the story, how this idea of objectivity came about and how we did that. Of, of course, that's not, um, and I understood that very early on, that cannot be done in a PhD. All right. Um, what I thought I might do instead was um, inspired by something very, very different, namely by a literary scholar from France, um, Jean Starobinsky, who wrote um, the history of two concepts um, as a biography. Um, and the book is called Action and Reaction. It was written in the 80s, so maybe none of you has ever heard of it or need to look at it, but it's actually very well written. And so it's about the life and the adventures of a couple of action and reaction and how they sort of in constant communication <clears throat> were changed. And what I thought I'd do is sort of, I, I write a biography of the discourse on Chinese logic. So I start around 1900 when the first people said, what we have in the Mo Jing and these other texts is actually logic. Then I see, I see it grow and mature. It comes, you know, it has a wild youth in the 1920s where, where there were many debates sort of which text should count as logic and which text shouldn't count. Um, then it matured in the 30s. So there were university professorships. There were many books uh, and histories. Then it kind of, uh, in, in mid-age, uh, things got rough. Revolution came in, war came in. Um, ideological pressures came in, people got tired, and they got old, and they died. But somehow they came through that. Uh, by 1978, sort of, they regained their chairs and they had um, departments um, in philosophy uh, where Chinese logic was taught. And, and sort of basically the whole discourse was um, um, going through a, a period of retirement, of calm. And then I thought by the end of my book, it would die because I thought actually, maybe we don't need much of that. Um, now, working on it, I found that there's a lot wrong with that image. I, I thought it would have been a, an appealing story, but I couldn't tell it. And um, and perhaps, and, and that's how I justify what I actually then did. It, it's more important to think about what happened before the discourse was born. So go back to this mode of genealogy. So instead of telling about, talking about the biography of, of the whole discourse, I just think about how it became possible to understand some of these texts at logic at all. And so that's what I then um, um, set out to do um, in this book called um, The Discovery of Chinese Logic. If I had any model that I could actually work with, it comes from, it's also completely forgotten, from a Japanese scholar, um, uh, Fuyanama, uh, Fuyanama Shinichi, who uh, wrote this book, um, A Study of Logic in the Meiji Period. And that was the closest I, I could find that I could do it. It's a brilliant book. It's, it's very dry. It's terminally dry. So it's not fun to read. Um, uh, but he does everything one needs to do. He looks into the sources of logical knowledge in the Meiji period, what Japanese scholars did with them, what were the conceptual transformations they did. Um, and he documents that sort of um, very, very um, diligently uh, year by year. And I also did um, some of that. So that's what I set out to do. Um, but I added one facet, and that was perhaps due to the fact that when we talk about logic in China, uh, clearly, even the word logic is a translation. So we need, you know, in order to understand how logic could become, or how it was possible to discover logic in Chinese texts, we have to look into translations. And I don't think that means that it's a derivative discourse, because, you know, logic always depends on translation. Um, Roger Bacon, in 1200 um, something already said, whoever knows a discipline such as logic or any other well and tries to translate it into his mother tongue will discover that that mother tongue is lacking in both substance and words. So it's a problem that we know from European histories. Whenever you want to translate a highly sophisticated scientific um, discourse into your own mother tongue, you need to work very, very hard. But I thought it was worth it. And so that's one lesson I took from Dustin and Gallison, namely, that it magnifies the originality to read past authors, my Chinese authors, 20th century Chinese authors, um, in their own terms, rather than tacitly to translate with inevitable distortions, their unfamiliar preoccupations into, into our own familiar ones. So I, I wanted to set out to try to trace the translations, what people did with translations and, and how they did that. Um, now, I didn't get very far. Um, I should have done, and I would have liked to do, to go through this process of discovery and translation in three stages. Um, the first one is a translation from European languages into Chinese. And we could say that was the Chinese discovery of European logic. So how did 
the modern language of logic, the modern idiom of logic come to China? What did Chinese scholars find in it? Why did they reject some parts of it? Why did it take so long um, to convince them? Um, and that's a process that needs to be um, um, traced very, very carefully. The second one then is the application of this new vocabulary to ancient texts. So instead of a translation between cultures, what we have in a second stage is a translation, you could say, within a culture, at least in, within something that we understand as one culture, although it clearly is not. Ancient China has nothing to do with the 20th century uh, of China, but at least there's some similarity in language. And so what happened in the second stage is that modern notions, globalized idioms of science that were translated into Chinese through various languages, Japanese and others. And so we find uh, a second stage where the new vocabulary is applied to ancient texts. That's another stage of translation and it produces new transformations of meaning. And then I would have liked to do what never did. And so I, I'll say something about that today because I never wrote about it. Um, it's basically how then did this second discovery, the application of the modern idiom to ancient Chinese texts become globally plausible? How was that spread around the world? And how did it come about that people writing in French, German, English, or any other European language now are also convinced that there is this tripod um, of logical um, um, traditions that we have around the world? So that was um, how I said um, about. So what I want to do now in the second half of my talk is basically sort of to go through some of these stages and say, well, what is remarkable about them? Um, I, I have to start, <laughs> well, in the 17th century. So go back to the first translations of logic, and some of you may um, be aware of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm tracing the birth of Chinese logic in 1898 uh, by going back to the 17th century. So it's a really, really long prenatal story that I think needs to be told. So here's um, um, the title page of, of the first um, treatise on logic that was translated into Chinese, uh, the very famous Ming Han, the investigations of the patterns of names, um, based on um, a Jesuit textbook of Aristotelian logic that was used in Coimbra um, in the early 17th century. It was a co-translation by Francisco Fortado and Li Jizao, um, a Chinese convert, um, and um, is, is a monument of scholarship. Um, it's absolutely unreadable. Um, if anyone ever wants to try. And the reason is not that their Chinese wasn't good enough, that they weren't learned enough or not, but that they had to create more than 1,000 new terms to adapt the language of the Colimbricenses into Chinese. And I spent you know, more than a year sort of trying to peel them out um, of this text. The interesting thing about this new language that they invented is that most of the terms they did invent were never used before and never answered after. So you could say it's a complete failure. It's basically, it's a, it's a scholarly monstrosity. You look at a text like that and it's, it's unreadable. So you have up to 40 new terms on one page and try to imagine reading that. It's like learning a foreign language. Um, and so some people have said, well, inevitably it failed. Um, then there's a, a second text um, that was translated um, in this period. Um, and, and we only have very bad copies of it. There's a re-edition now thankfully, uh, thanks to scholars in, in Guangzhou um, and in Belgium, namely um, a cursus philosophicus by Ferdinand Fabis that was um, submitted to the Kangxi Emperor in 1683. And that contained not only the full Minglitan under a different title because they wanted to veil um, that it was uh, related to that text, but also um, five chapters translated from the commentary on Aristotle's um, um, first analytic where actually the syllogism and, and all these other logical things were. Now, both texts failed completely to arouse Chinese interest. Um, and it, there were a couple of um, um, plausible explanations for that. One um, that was held by Jean-Claude Martzloff, who is a historian of Chinese mathematics and looked into these texts. He basically said, well, it couldn't be understood because uh, he says um, all these new terms were basically just phonetic renditions. So a term like logic would be translated as luer jia, um, or uh, mathematics would be made made jia, uh, and clearly no Chinese could bear reading all this. Um, the sad thing is that apparently Maslow only read the first 10 pages of the book, because after that, all these um, phonetic renditions are given proper semantic renditions. So logic is no longer just luer jia, but it's bian yi, the art of debating and all that. So um, the notion that it was because of the bad language, the bad terminology, uh, terminological choices that logic failed, 
I think cannot be substantiated. There's a variation of that. Um, and here I show you an overview of the narratives of failure that are around. First is failed translation because of terminology. Second is um, there's an incapacity of the Chinese language to accommodate Western logic. That was held, for instance, by Jacques Gernet in his very famous and otherwise very good book about how, how um, Christianity came to China. Um, Jarnet basically said, well, the Chinese, they would have, of course, accepted European logic, naturally, because it would have helped them so much. But unfortunately, their language didn't allow them to, because they didn't have the verb to be. And so and they didn't have a copula. And so they couldn't see um, the beauty of, of Aristotelian syllogisms, because it just didn't work in Chinese. That too, I would say, um, is um, well-meaning. Um, but utterly misguided, because clearly everything that can be said in Western languages that is related to the verb to be can, of course, be remodeled in Chinese ways. So even if you don't have an explicit copula, we have um, subject predicate sentences that can be done. So that can be do. And I, I have long you know, um, ruminations about uh, why that is wrong. Um, a, a third explanation is basically that the, the thinking in these books was incommensurable to Chinese ways of thought. Um, that is held, for instance, by um, Benjamin Elman in his book On Their Own Terms uh, and many others. And he said, well, it, it clearly, um, um, there's some things in um, the logical text that no Chinese could accept. For instance, that thinking is located in the brain. Um, and, and that was the official reason why the Chumli the here, the Cursus Philosophicus, was uh, rejected. But, but that, too, I think doesn't really do it. Um, because, you know, Chinese scholars were very much aware of what happened um, and the, um, the, led, the reasons they gave why um, um, Jesuit books were unacceptable were exactly the same that were mobilized um, to condemn other heresies at the same time inside China. So <laughs> if, if someone sort of said something about the human body, that was a stock sentence to basically saying, this is unorthodox, it needs to be burned. And clearly they were onto something because the only reason um, that Christian authors gave for to the Chinese for studying logic was once they were through it, once they learned the foreign language of logic, they would realize the truth of the one and only God. Um, and to my mind, that was not a very attractive goal. So why would you go through all these pains to learn, you know, 1000 new terms and to operate with them in order to be convinced by a foreign God in which you don't believe, in which you didn't believe and you didn't want to believe? And clearly, um, no one, um, um, no official uh, would be behind that. Why would they actually support heresy? Um, nevertheless, so, so whatever the, the reason may be, what we have um, to say is that we have this first episode in the 17th century, in the 1630s and the 1680s, a, a lot of effort, beautiful texts that no one reads and no one read uh, for a very long time. And you could say it was a complete failure. No Chinese scholar said there's anything interesting in there, um, with the exception of some Christian converts who said, well, I, I have found God and therefore I will take the pains of reading it. But it was never used much. OK, then we have to jump to a, a second part of the translation of European logic that didn't really go much better at first, sadly. Um, it, it started with the stern looking uh, gentleman to the right, um, um, Joseph Atkins, who in 1886 translated one book on logic, a, a, short, a short logic primer, middle school primer, um, in a series of texts on, on 15 European sciences. Um, and it, the book was mixed in there. Um, not many people talked about it at all. Um, Liang Ti Chao uh, said, um, this is a book that is completely unclassifiable. I have no idea what it's about. And so in his Xi Xie Shu Mu Biao, in his um, um, catalog of Western books, he listed it next to cookbooks and museum guides. Um, another bibliographer of, of the same period said, this is a completely unreadable book, but I think it talks about dialects. Um, and therefore, he listed it together with books on linguistics. Um, a, a third one, um, <laughs> a third one says, um, and the third one is Liang Zhichao again, a couple of years later. He said, well, no, this is, this is classifiable. It's not like cookbooks and museum guides. It's actually a book about nerves. It's about how the brain functions. Um, and so there was there was utter misunderstanding. And, and one of the reasons might be, in this case, actually the translation, because Joseph Atkins, um, you know, for perhaps very good reasons, uh, out of modesty, didn't coin new terms for which he didn't find a, a Chinese equivalent, but rather he gave um, paraphrases. 
So the whole book was full of paraphrases and you were on very shaky ground trying to understand what he meant by these paraphrases because you never had a technical term that actually told you what it is. So you have something for propositions. I, I just listed a couple there. So, so, so once again, uh, you could say, well, <laughs> this is kind of hard to understand. Um, and why would anyone do that? And, and Atkins himself wasn't very fond of logic. It didn't make a good argument. So once again, failure, utter miscomprehension, not because you know anyone in China would have been unable to understand, but because this text didn't do it and they didn't have a reason to actually study it. Another one, um, equally weird, also totally forgotten, uh, by Yin Yongjing. Um, he wrote uh, actually a book on psychology that included a chapter on logic. Um, it's called the, the Science of the Soul, Xin Ning Xue, um, and it was used at um, uh, St. John's College um, in, in, in Shanghai uh, from the late 1880s onwards to teach psychology and also um, a class in logic. But Yin Yong Jing also said, this is a very strange science. I don't know what to do with it. So he, so he said in his, in his preface, he says, there are many ideas in this book that have never been discussed in China and for which we do not even have terms. Thus, there were no designations to convey them. I have tentatively created new designations for words that could not be expressed and forcibly tied them together. So basically he made little marks at the, at, at, if he had five characters in a row um, to, to indicate that that was one word actually. Um, but it, it, I've never seen that before. Maybe some of you have. Uh, to readers of this book who look at these new words from the outside, they may appear confused and difficult to distinguish. And I, I say, yes, they, they do. But for those who exert their minds and examine them, it will not be hard to grasp their derivation. For their great number, I apologize. So once again, someone who's forced to invent hundreds of new terms. And, and you know, just to give you an example here, uh, it's one opening paragraph. And, and if you read it in English translation, it sounds in a modernizing translation, so not how contemporary readers would have understood it. It sounds fairly straightforward. Deductive and inductive logic are both concerned with propositions. A proposition is a sentence in which two distinct concepts are connected, right? And, and so it goes on. But if you look at the Chinese, these were all neologisms. Everything that I marked in red were new terms. So, so once again, for a reader trying to, to work her or his way through this thing, what they would need to do is basically to learn an entirely new language that is only defined in relation to other new terms. And so once again, it's not impossible. If you have a patient teacher, if you have a reason to do it, and if you spend a lot of energy and time, you may understand what it is. Um, but apparently no one did, because once again, all these hundreds of terms come onto the pile of, of obsolete words that we have in the history of logic. Good. Then finally, finally, uh, the turning of the tides. Um, everyone knows that, you know, this is the father of Chinese logic, um, which is Yen Fu, who, who translated um, Mill's system of logic um, over many years. He started in 1900. Um, the, the first half was published in 1903, and then it came out in 1905. Now, um, this is generally seen as the beginning of logic. And um, many commentators have said with this book, um, what we understand as European logic was uh, arrived in China, and it was there for everyone to see. Um, the problem is, that the people who say that never read Mill's System of Logic, because Mill's System of Logic is not a book that actually teaches you logic. It's a book of, on the philosophy of logic. So it talks about, in a meta level, what logic could be, what it could do, but it never shows you how you can actually do it. So it's very strange. Um, Yen Fu, of course, um, still translated into his very own style, um, which was very difficult to read. Um, and yet, I think his main function, or his most important function, is not so much to translate that, but that he was a relentless propagator of what he considered to be the science of sciences. So he wrote endless essays and, and remarks about why logic is the thing that China needs to survive uh, in the modern world. Um, so um, to give you uh, one example, so he says the insights in Mill's logic, and he was writing to his publisher there to get an advance to, to finance his opium habit. So he may have exaggerated a little bit, but he said the insights in Mill's logic are as numerous as ox hair or silk threads in a cocoon. Once the book it out, is out, it will do away with 90% of China's old patterns of thought and people's minds will gain the utmost strength from its application. So he went on and on and on with arguments like that. Um, and he became um, a little bit of a pop star. So, so we have records of him that he goes through the country. Um, he travels to Shanghai, for instance, um, has a theater sold out, 500 people, two Shanghai is there. Um, we have records by Zhang Binglin was there, Liu Shipei was there, um, Bao Tianxiao, who wrote about it, was there. And he says that it was a great evening. So he came in looking all disheveled. Um, um, he came late 
two hours because he always had a pipe of opium after after uh, lunch. Um, and then he started declaiming, um, first in English, um, then in, in Minanhua, uh, and then in his heavily accented uh, mainland, uh, sort of uh, uh, Mandarin Chinese, uh, and people were riveted. And Bao Tianxiao said no one understood a word of what he was saying, but they all agreed this was a momentous event in the history of Chinese um, uh, thinking. And so <laughs> Yen Fu perhaps didn't teach a lot of people logic, um, he himself uh, didn't have any interest in that, but as a propagator, he paved the ground for the acceptance of logic that would happen much later. And that was not related to texts at all, but rather to institutional developments. So from 1902 onwards, not least thanks to um, Yen Fu's lobbying, um, logic was included as a course in the new curricula that were soon to replace the Chinese examination system. So this is from um, um, the um, uh, uh, official regulations that were first developed at the Jingshu Daishu Tang at the Metropolitan University in uh, Beijing, but they were supposed to be applied throughout the empire and they included courses on logic. So in order to do that, what people needed were two things, textbooks and teachers, um, and they had none, um, which started a race by savvy publishers and by people who you know, were looking for job opportunities to either publish these books, translate these books, or to learn how to teach these. Um, and that then finally uh, led to the real Chinese discovery uh, of, of logic. Uh, within less than eight years, we have 25 textbooks on logic that appeared, mostly from Japanese translation. And very soon, this terminology they used was standardized. They were taught throughout the empire, and with that, logical terms became finally sort of tangible for people. Right. So, so that happened. And that is when logic finally arrived. All right. So, so that's um, the one stage of the translation process. The Chinese discovery of European logic took almost 300 years, was a very hard process. But by 1902, 1903, 1904, logic was in the air. And we find many also popular political writings. Um, Liu Shipei has a piece on inductive and deductive political parties. So, so these, these concepts find um, very strange uh, usages. And once this was done, a couple of people started to wonder whether China had anything similar to, but only then. Um, and, and this, once again, it started not in China. Um, like so many things, it started in Japan. So, so the first people who actually said there was something like Chinese logic uh, are these two gentlemen, Kaniya Yoshimaru and, and uh, Kuwaki Genyuku, who are um, teachers of philosophy. Um, and they started writing um, short essays um, on Xunzi. So they didn't look at the Mo Jing, they didn't look at Gun Songlong. They said Xunzi is the one who actually started the debate of logic in China, and that is a tradition. So, so they have these brief pieces, and if, if you're interested, you can um, look at them. Um, this idea was then picked up um, by the same Liang Qichao, who first said, I have no idea what logic is. Uh, it might be related to, ner to nerves, who also said in 1902, the lack of logic is the greatest weakness of Chinese philosophical thinking. But then he started reading these Japanese uh, uh, authors, and that gave him a completely different idea. He said, no, no, actually, we have something like that, and we have to find it in our classics. So he wrote um, in, in 1904, uh, Liang Tichao wrote an essay uh, called uh, Master Mo's Logic, uh, the logic of the, uh, 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 of the Mohists. Um, and of course, at that time, uh, the riddles of the Mo Jing and the textual problems were not resolved. Um, they were still in disorder. We didn't know how the canons and the explanations were hanging together. That's something that Liang Tichao resolved in the 1920s. But he already had an idea what we should do with it. So he said, the civilizations of the modern West have their roots in the age of the revitalization of ancient knowledge, meaning in the Renaissance. We should follow this example, for it is clear that correlating ancient Chinese knowledge with new European patterns is anything but a useless undertaking for us today. So what Liang Yichao said is, the Renaissance, the Renaissance that is at the root of Western power and strength, consisted in reinterpreting the classics. Now that we have a new language, the new language of modernity that came in from Japan, we have to follow this example in order to revitalize our own classics and bring about our own modernity. And so this is an idea that became extremely, extremely attractive to many people throughout the 20th century when working on Chinese logic. Liang Qichao himself perhaps wasn't the most convincing um, 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 uh, explorer 
uh, of these connections. So, so the essay that he wrote there about Master Mo's logic was pretty much, a, and I, 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 sorry, I don't have the Chinese here, but I, I, I can give it to you later. It's pretty much an exercise that he tries to understand what logic is. He takes that from some textbooks, and then he finds one notion in the Mozil that actually corresponds to it. So here, here's an example. He says, the purpose of disputation of bien um, is to clarify the distinction between right and wrong to clarify points of sameness and difference, to inquire into the patterns of names and objects, and by settling the beneficial and harmful to resolve confusions and doubt. Only after describing what is so of the myriad things can one seek out what is comparable um, um, and the multitude of sayings. Uh, and then he, he just has a footnote and says, note, by Master Mo calls this disputation. This is logic. This passage explains the definitions and applications of logic. The definition um, um, basically um, is similar to what famous Western specialists said. And he does that for 25 notions. So it's basically a matching of meanings, the meanings that he finds in logic textbooks that he has from Japan. And he puts the more next to it and finds for each thing that is actually important, an inference, a conclusion, a premise, um, he finds an equivalent in the more. So he operates pretty much um, like a paleographer so you find the, the dinosaur's pinky, um, but you have an idea what a dinosaur should be. You have an idea what the system of logic might be. And so from this pinky finger, what you reconstruct is the whole system of logic and he found it in Morse. And then his conclusion at the end of this article is that Morse is not only equivalent to Aristotle, but he's Aristotle and Francis Bacon in one, because he also found you know, traditional syllogistics as well um, as inductive logic, it was, was done by Francis Bacon and onwards if, in this very brief text of the Morse. So, so that is one uh, way of doing it. And it, it's one of the uh, more influential ways um, of actually matching the meanings and translating within Chinese culture from modern Chinese, now westernized contexts um, to the ancient um, texts. Um, a scholar in, I, in my book, I, I, saw, I have a couple more, and there's a great variety of opinions on this problem. Uh, basically, the polar opposite of Yang Chichao um, was Wang Wei. You remember Wang Guowei said, um, and I cited that early on, that China also, they had debates, but they didn't have logic. He also changed his mind in 1905, but not as drastic as Liang Chichao at all. So he says, Moses' theory of definition and inference were neither comprehensive or concise, nor subtle or detailed. Even though Master Mo based his insights on random facts and was unable to, <laughs> to discover um, um, formal laws, he still deserves to be revered as the founding ancestor of logic in China. So he says, you know, we had something like that. But then he concludes this essay by saying, all right, all what we can do with that is we put it in the archive. We said we had it. Unfortunately, it died out um, in 141 BCE. Um, and since then, it never had in, any influence on what we did. So that's a very different um, um, assessment of what happens. It's perhaps the scholarly, from a scholarly point of view, the more sincere one, um, but it's not the one that won out. So, and that's basically where, where I end in the book. So, so that's the first stage. Um, and, and then the, the question, so what happened after? So once it was discovered, how did it become stabilized? How did it become popularized? How was it disseminated? And that's, we could describe that as a, another process, um, basically from discovery to the invention of a tradition. I didn't want to talk about inventions of traditions in my book. I still don't want to really, um, but I think it's, there's something to it because it was blown up uh, beyond all proportions. Um, the author who started it, the whole process, was Hu Shi. So Hu Shi, as many of you know, um, wrote a dissertation at Columbia um, called The Development of the Logical Method in Ancient China. Um, and it's not so important what he actually said in the book. He found um, very strange equivalents of logic. He talks about the Yi Jing. He talks about um, the Zhang Ming. Um, and Karin de Fort has written about that recently and, and, and many other things. But what is important is his preface, where he actually tells us what he's doing. So he says, um, there's the problem that we have to deal with. And the reason why he wrote the book on the logical method in China, which he also found a very important part of the modern sciences and the whole package of modernity, the, pro the question we have to answer is, how can we Chinese feel at ease in this new world, which at first sight appears to be so much at variance with what we have long regarded as our own civilization? So he says, that's the problem we have to um, answer. So we have to find some kind of continuity between our ancient traditions of learning and the modern achievances um, of the sciences. And logic for him 
was one of the prime areas in which this continuity needed to be maintained. So he says, um, only when we studied these long neglected native systems in the light and with the aid of modern Western philosophy, only then can we truly feel at ease with the new methods and instrumentalities of speculation and research. So for him, it was not so much about whether it was actually accurate to attribute to the Mojing, to the Yijing, or, or to these other um, uh, texts that they really talked about logic. He didn't care too much about that. But he said, it's a task that we need to tackle. We need to find the continuity because otherwise we will never be able to find true, to feel truly at ease with these new methods and instrumentalities. So once we know that we've had it before, we will be open to studying it and it will become a part of our um, contemporary vocabulary and of the arsenal of weapons that we have um, to modernize um, and, and to do sciences. And jumping ahead, and then I, I'm sure I'm about to um, come to the next stage, um, it's basically um, um, the most famous example of this mode of, of doing it is someone that some of you may have heard of, um, Zhang Shijiao, who is a political journalist, um, an advocate of democracy, uh, a very famous writer. Um, and he gave perhaps the, the best attended lectures in logic globally in 1917 at Beida. Um, he was um, populating the largest lecture hall of Beida, People were hanging on the windows to listen to him talk about logic, which really doesn't happen often in the history of logic. Hundreds of people came and, and were riveted. And there were newspapers reports about it that Zhang Shijiao was talking about logic. Um, uh, the book didn't come out until 1939, so much, much later. Um, but it's what, what we have from the book is based on the lectures he gave there. He had a similar project like um, Hu Shi. And of course, Hu Shi was um, later his colleague at, at Beida. He basically say, so um, what I want to prove is that the science of names in the pre qian period, and he used Yen Fu's terms, um, and European logic are indeed like two wheels of a carriage. They rotate each other in moving forward. So he claimed parity. And in his book, he wanted to prove that basically European logic and Chinese logic were on a par and the one couldn't do without the other. What's interesting is that all the theoretical parts come from European logic. So all the laws of thought, all the different um, forms of inference are coming from the European wheel. And the Chinese wheel are basically just examples that he finds in poetry, in short prose. Uh, Liu Zongyuan is one of the most logical writers he finds. But so what he, what he claims is in China is not explicit logical theorizing. It's just sort of applications of these laws. So what he proves rather than <laughs> that European logic and Chinese logic are actually similar, equal, is that Chinese practices of argumentation do not violate a lot of European laws. But he doesn't say that as clearly. He sells it in an entirely different manner and says it's actually um, the same thing. And it's, it's an interesting book. I'm, I'm not aware. Someone should write a PhD on that. I'm trying to find someone. It's exceedingly hard to read um, because he liked Yen Fu's terminology and tried to emulate Yen Fu's style. But if anyone you know, is looking for a topic, Zhang Shijiao is the man that you want to look in. That, that's the book. It's, it's also long enough for a PhD. Anyway, so, so that happens. Um, what, what we have in this, in this period, the first um, post-discovery period, is basically a call for participation. Chinese scholars like Hu Shi, like Zhang Shijiao, and there, there's a couple of others, basically wanted to become accepted as part of a global discourse uh, on logic. And they wanted to be like the others. They want to say, we can participate in this enterprise. We have something to, to contribute. And, and we are basically working in the same or, or towards the same universal goals. That was a short phase that ended um, pretty much. Um, hang on. Oh, well, I, I, I talked about him. That ended pretty much um, in the early 30s. So in the early 1930s, um, there is a shift in mood in China. It's not so much about participating in a universal enterprise, but rather highlighting the specificity, the native roots, the bentu hua, uh, and, and many other things in China. And, and so that then is the, for the first time a claim that not only did China always have logic, but it also has a different kind of logic, a logic that doesn't do what the West does, but does something independent of that. Um, the first example is by someone who's well known as a calligrapher, but not so much as a teacher of logic by the name of Yu, who's a Buddhist scholar who wrote in 1930s already um, sort of a, a treatise in, in which he said that, you know, the West has its logic, the Indians have Yin Ming, but we have our Ming Xue, we have our, our science of names, and that functions differently. Um, and, and he, for the first time, formulates sort of uh, the tripod um, in, in a beautiful fashion with actually different functions attributed to the different legs. 
So that too is an interesting book. Uh, Jan Verhofsky has written a, a beautiful piece about it recently. So if anyone's interested in that, um, you may want to read that. Um, this is carried on by Zhang Dong Sun. Um, I don't know if anyone read Zhang Dong Sun um, thoroughly. Um, he was one perhaps of the most sophisticated philosophical thinkers that we have um, in China in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and he came up with this idea that um, Aristotelian logic is a logic of substance and Chinese logic, because of the different structures of the Chinese language, is a logic of relationships. Um, that was very much in line with um, a form of linguistic determinism, Benjamin Worf, um, and uh, Edward Sapir were very much interested in Zhang Dong Sun's essay. They translated them into English, had them published in their um, um, journal. Um, and that became another strand of thinking about Chinese logic that basically, because the different structures of languages lend themselves to different forms of inferences, therefore the different cultures that we have in the Western China um, have come about. Um, and, and it's still very much worth reading. Um, it may be a bit exaggerated. Uh, it may be not quite accurate what he says, uh, but it's also something that we should look into. Um, I, I have only have two more examples, and then, you know, I, I'll say something what this all means. Um, so the two more examples is, well, then 1949 comes in, um, which, of course, is another big break in writing the history of Chinese philosophy. Um, we have finally uh, Chinese philosophy being independent, um, and, and that is something that um, is continued under the communist um, uh, rule. Um, but in very different terms. So it takes a while before someone again writes on Chinese logic. Um, the first book I'm aware of is, is by a certain Zhang Dianfeng, um, who wrote in 1956 a, a history uh, of most formal logic. And he is a very good Marxist, and he tells us why he can prove that the tripod is actually valid. So he has in, in his preface, he says, well, we know that logical forms um, and laws are the results of practices humans have repeated billions of times. So it's a materialist interpretation. Once social development advances to a certain stage, abstract thought also achieves considerable sophistication. The various sciences are established in elementary form and spontaneous logic becomes self-aware. This means that people begin to study thinking itself, summarize the thought experience of their forebears, abstract its forms and laws, and establish a scientific discipline in our case, logic. So that's the general pattern. And it has to be universal because if you're a Marxist, it has to apply to all. Now, what he says next um, is basically, so it, here is how, it, oh, I can't, I can't. Yeah, and then he says, um, since logic emerged in ancient India and then again emerged in ancient Greece, it had to emerge in China too. Had it failed to do so, this would have violated the laws according to which thought developed. So that's a very interesting proof. He basically says, well, I, I, I can't give you any, proof that we actually had it, but it has to have been there because otherwise, otherwise the Marxist laws wouldn't hold. So, so it's an inductive proof of a very um, a specific kind. And then his whole book goes on about that. He always says, well, this is what we have in Greece. This is what we have in India. It was all necessary. And therefore we find it too in the Mojing. Um, once again, it's a very strange mode uh, of interpretation. And it may also be the reason why it took Chinese scholars so long to finally write a real history of ancient Chinese logic. So we're now a hundred years almost, after, well, not quite, at least we're several decades after the discovery of Chinese logic in European terms. And yet we still don't have a real book writing the history. There's some efforts in the 1930s, but they usually fail. There's an announcement by Wang Yanji um, uh, uh, from Hanan who wants to write a history of Chinese logical thought, but all he gets to publish in the, the 1960s, so until the, the Cultural Revolution, is an analysis of the materials related to the history of Chinese logical thought. So he puts together all the examples that he has, but he doesn't manage to write the history um, for some reason. He doesn't tell us why, but at least they're very well valuable books because they bring together everything that has been said about Bien and Lun and Tui, um, and it's a start. And later we have a five volume edition of, of all that with all these quotations brought together. So it's helpful. Um, Wang never gave up. So throughout the Chinese, uh, the Cultural Revolution, he tried to write the history and, and lo and behold, um, he did finish it in 1979, a history of Chinese logical thought that finally came about. And for that reason, he's immortalized on the campus of his university in Hanan um, because he's the founder and the first one who did that. Um, once that was done, we could say, um, and that's pretty much um, one 
um, contempt uh, one uh, temporary end of what I'm going to tell you. So, so with that sort of, we have a, an avalanche of publications that come out. So, so from the 19, late 1970s onwards, we, we have all these books coming out, um, many um, different ones uh, every year about the history of Chinese logic. So, so then the whole thing kicks in and we, we have um, hundreds of bookshelves uh, full of, of all these books. So that, that's a very welcome development and we've learned a great deal from that. And so you would think that, you know, there it is. The tripod is complete. Um, and, and for a while, um, that was the case until, until um, this gentleman came about. Um, probably no one has heard of him. Um, of you among you, but he's a very interesting case study. So he's someone Chang Jung Kang. He, he basically, um, for his whole life, taught logic in a journalism school outside of Canton um, to party cadres and was teaching them dialectical logic. Um, and while he was teaching, he read widely on the history of Chinese logic and what the establishment did and all that. Um, and he collected materials against them because he thought this is not what logic should be about. Um, and so then when he finally retired, he sent some of the papers expressing his doubts to various people in Beijing, influential people who, who could help publish it. And he found a couple of supporters in Beijing at Beida who thought, well, this is interesting what he has to say. And then he published this book, um, The Deconstruction of Ancient Chinese Logic. And he has these, you know, the scare quotes uh, around it. And this is a book that really comes out, out swinging. So, so he says, um, hang on, oops. Uh, he says, uh, right at the beginning, uh, when historians of Chinese logic wish to prove the legitimacy of ancient Chinese logic, they often declare it was a tool in the service of political and ethical thought. And strangely, they do not realize that this is precisely the proof of its illegitimacy. It demonstrates that ancient Chinese logic is in fact opposed to logic's true self, but it is rather its alienated other. It is mere ideology. And he then goes on, so if he has, has a whole um, hundred pages of theories that there is no logic in China. Uh, then he engages with all these interpretations of the Mo Jing that the best scholars at the Academy of Social Sciences at Nankai and everywhere else did. And he basically proves them to be not really logic. Um, he says, well, what you're talking about is sacred doctrines. Um, and you're talking about cultural parity. You're not talking at all um, about logic. Uh, and he even claims in the, in the preface to his own work, he says, well, this is a book by a, an author suffering from aphasia, which is sort of a, 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 a language disorder that you cannot communicate with other people because he just can't fall in line. He can't help it, right? And so he publishes this book. And of course, the inevitable happens. Um, the empire strives back. Um, but it creates a, a lot of debate. So then, you know, the, the full machine is, is sort of mobilizing. And here's sort of some of the authors who, who took part in, in a debate against him or in a campaign against him. He's accused of national nihilism. He's accused of being a, a Western stooge. Um, he's accused of being an imperialist, a, a lackey of the Japanese. Um, some uh, have a bit more moderate uh, ways, but there, there was at least a renewed uncertainty. So, so the, the tripod was really completed beautifully by the year 2000, and then some pensioner uh, from southern Guangzhou um, comes about um, and, and sort of unsettles it all. So, so I went and, and talked to him. Um, he lived with his daughter at the time, then he was uh, put in an oldies home later, and I, I don't know if he survived COVID. I, I have no news what happened to him uh, later, unfortunately. Um, but he basically said it was such fun to write that book, and he had to do it before he was on his way out. Um, and I, I thought that was a really brave thing to do. Um, and, you know, it's completely, you know, logic centric, um, Eurocentric in, in many ways, but at least it's someone who just stands up and says, well, the emperor has no clothes or has not has little clothes. So we, we should think about that. It's much more radical than anything I would ever have wanted to say. Um, but it's good that this debate um, continues. Now, with this renewed um, uncertainties, um, we had a debate that that we already had before painfully uh, about um, the legitimacy of Chinese philosophy. And we have a repeat of that debate. Some of you might remember it um, uh, with uh, Chinese logic. And it replays the same arguments and only very few um, authors break out of it. Um, one who, whom I recommend is uh, Jin Rongdong, who's at, at Hua Shida in Shanghai, who really thinks about, so what? where do we go now with Chinese logic? Shall we just repeat what we have been doing before? So shall we do um, beautiful, 
interpretations of the ancient texts. And he, he gives us a, a couple of examples. So here's um, some of the best scholarship that came out, and it, it's really very much uh, worth reading. Tanji um, Fu's um, Morbian Far Away tries to um, playfully interpret uh, the Morbian, the Moist canons, first in the language of Western logic, then in the language of Yin Ming, and then in a language that he um, invents of his own. So it's a beautiful thought experiment, and he shows um, what the potential might be of that. Another one, Wufei Bai, also written already in the 1930s, um, is sort of an encyclopedia um, of the school of names. And it's it's basically the, the volume that um, um, Ian Johnston sort of praises the most in his recent translation of Mingjia texts that we have um, in English. So uh, what I'm saying is, um, despite certain doubts, despite a certain contingency, in whether we really need to talk about Chinese logic or not, um, a lot of very valuable scholarship is done in China and also in the West. So, so just to give you some um, recent work in the West that I, I find is really, really uh, very evocative and that every one of you should, you know, look into deeply, um, uh, the, the great compendia of the Mingjia, and I, you know, it's, a, you know, <laughs> For 10 A4 pages to be blown up into a thousand with all the commentaries and everything that happened ever after um, is a beautiful achievement. And there, there you have the whole encyclopedia. Um, also, Raphael uh, Suter in Zurich is, is just preparing a new full translation of the Gongsun Lung so that will come out soon. And he has um, a various project on it. And then finally, Feng Yaoming, um, sort of who, who doesn't write about Chinese logic anymore, but about Chinese philosophy of logic. Um, others write about Chinese philosophy of language and logic, so they, they become a bit coy about it. But he too sort of does beautiful historical work um, that is being done. Um, I think this is all good and it should be done. But uh, what I want to talk about next week, when um, Henry's already looking sternly at me because I'm over time, um, <laughs> um, what I want to talk about next week is I, I wonder whether this is all we can do all we can learn for a global history of logic when looking into China, because I think there's still two defects, or not defects, two things that one should be aware of. The first is, um, it still seems to be the case that we follow too much Hush's and Yang Zhichao's program, that we absolutely need to find a system of logic that is equivalent in all respects, and in, especially in coherence, to what we know to be logic in the European case. Um, that might be, you could say, a Eurocentric bias. The other bias that I think is still around is a modernist bias. We only look into theories about language and logical thought um, if there's any connection to something that we find interesting today from a logical perspective. Um, and that we could call this modernist bias. And I think that's also perhaps hindering us from seeing what actually goes on. So what I will do next week is maybe you know, raise the question whether what we could really learn from looking into Chinese traditions is not so much whether their logical fragment, their logical theories were the same or different, but rather if we imagine a culture that was heavily argumentative from the beginning, but didn't have a theory codified that you could point to, to justify your conclusions, well, how did they know who was right and who was wrong. Shouldn't we rather look into the practices of argumentation, see what the implicit standards of validity, that's a term that Ari Levine and I used earlier, um, used in order to find out how reasoning functions. And then I think that would also have global significance because if we can show, and I think we can, the Chinese argumentation was in no way less rational or logical than what happened in many, many Western philosophical debates then maybe the status of theory that we ascribe to logic in the history of thought, in the history of philosophy, in the history of reasoning, might be woefully overrated. And we have to think anew, I, I hope to show, about the status of theory when we think about these things. And that would be, I think, another methodological thought that we can hopefully pursue next week if someone comes back. So I'll, I'll just leave it here and I, I thank you very much. Oh, no, I wanted to read, okay, one more quote. I need to do that. So the one thing that basically kept me going through 20 years of, of doing research in that was, was a, a quote from um, 1159 um, that I find absolutely beautiful. And that I think is the only methodological principle that no none of us should ever violate. Namely, that which is written should be studied with sympathetic mildness and not tortured on the rack like a helpless prisoner until it renders what it never received. 
And I th that was a thought that I had to remember a lot of times when I read Liang Qichao, when I read Hu Shi, Zhang Shijiao, and all these others. I thought, well, if you had read old John of Salisbury, maybe, maybe you would have done something different with your theories. All right, so I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Court. So we're now going to open the chat. Um, so if you'd um, like to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat or you can um, sort of raise your uh, your virtual hand. Um, but just to sort of kick us off then. Um, so thank you so much, um, Professor Kurtz, for what I'm sure everyone will agree is a, a truly illuminating um, biography of, of Chinese logic and for sort of walking us through in a sense, um, you know, what has been sacrificed in the ding of um, a kind of global um, reconstruction of, of, of logic. Um, so my question is, is kind of focused in on um, your, your research processes. And um, so you noted at one point this um, translation of uh, Joseph Edkin's work was mm -hmm. kind of variously understood as belonging to kind of uh, quite unexpected categories, right, or genres of, of text. And so I'm curious when you were kind of researching these kinds of like prenatal stages um, uh, of, of Chinese logic, um, how did you kind of find those sources if they were kind of put in places that were a little unexpected? What was that process like? Um, it was hard. Um, there was no internet, if you remember, when, because I'm old. Uh, and so many of these texts, especially these textbooks, they needed to be found in provincial libraries. Um, one of the best sources that I saw John Judge is here, she also knows that, is the Shanghai Tzu Shu Chu Ban Che, the dictionary publishing house, which inherited the Zhonghua Shu Ju library. Uh, and when we first visited and were allowed to go in, they had a pile of textbooks rotting away in one corner. Um, and 10 of them were about logic. And they, they couldn't believe that anyone would be interested in them. Um, and I was. Um, and, and so <laughs> that raised the price. Um, but I did get copies of that. So there was a lot of that going on. Then there was a lot of, um, well, so I was inspired by Foucault after all. I mean, Foucault says in order to understand a process, you have to follow every statement in Orsay. You have to basically have the totality of statements that you have. And for a time I was obsessed and I took far too long to doing my study. So don't do that. But for a time I was obsessed to find every little snippet that was written about logic in the Chinese language until 1900. Um, and I'm sure I failed, but I, I I looked around wherever I could. So journals, whenever I found a trace somewhere, I asked everyone that I knew. Um, I went to Japan because many of the things were there, now beautifully digitized in the Meiji Lib. If I had that, that would have saved me two years of my life. Um, so, so there's a lot of stuff um, that you just actually have to hunt down. And I think there's no way around it. And the illusion that we now have is that everything is digitized and what's not digitized is not there. And that is an absolute catastrophe, which I see in my doctoral students also. Um, you have to go there. And I know, of course, now it was difficult for several years and it gets harder every time, but you have to hunt whatever you find or can find. Even in places that you don't expect them to be. Yeah, for sure, thank you. Um, so if there are any other questions, um, feel free to add those. Uh, or raise your hand and we'll kind of keep an eye on um, I'm not seeing any at the moment. So perhaps I'll squeeze in a second one, <laughs> which is um, I was wondering if you could sort of compare the, the sort of biography of logic to mm -hmm. perhaps kind of the broader, um, I'm, it's maybe a large question, but with the kind of biography of philosophy more broadly, mm -hmm. they share a great deal in common um, or do they have kind of different trajectories? Yeah, I mean, so originally um, I settled for logic because I thought I couldn't do Chinese philosophy. So I started with this project because I, I read a lot on um, Chinese philosophy for years. Um, and I, I, at some point I thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with me, but I just don't get how it's, it's really philosophically as interesting as some authors claim or philosophically as useless as others claim. Um, and so therefore I, I thought I, I'd choose a smaller field. And logic seemed to be that smaller field. And I think also in the larger context of the history of sciences, logic is very peculiar. Because if you write, and you know, Karin Chamela will talk to you in, 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 in a month or something, or in a couple of weeks. Of course, when you talk about the history of Chinese mathematics, there's an infinite number of texts there. There's a tradition there that was alive. Um, astronomy is the same thing. Medicine is the same thing. So, so many of the sciences, of course, were very 
heavily, very well developed um, in China, but for logic, we just don't have any traces. Clearly, there was some logical thought and awareness of logical question in ancient China, no doubt about that, but it wasn't a tradition. The Mo Jing was buried away in the corners of the Taoist canon. It wasn't really understood until the 17th, 18th century, the Mo Jing only in the 1920s. Um, and so logic is a very special case in that regard, but I think it also highlights a couple of questions that may be in a milder form, may also affect the other ones. Great, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Mariana, you have a question, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, hi, um, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, hearing you talk about the status of theory of logic and so on, I started wondering if a lot of these arguments, whether there was or wasn't logic in China, or there was or wasn't philosophy in China, because that was a debate at some point, uh, is more of an argument about the terms, what we define as logic, and not logic and at some like at which point um we stop categorizing something as the same thing and saying mm. that what was in china is not logic but what we have here in europe is logic and so on mm. so i wonder if it's a question of uh, terminology rather than history and um, uh, what um, do you think about it mm, let me put it that way um no <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, terminology is mobilized and these category mistakes and then sort of the, someone insists on one definition of logic or one definition of philosophy and says, well, and therefore China cannot be part of it. But I think these are all very flexible and stretchable. I think for, for philosophy, there can be no argument that, that Chinese thinkers don't have a place in this. I, I think this is absolutely ludicrous to do that. For logic, if, if you want to keep some actual sense, namely that it's explicit theorizing about the validity of certain forms of argument. That's a very broad definition already. If you want to keep that, it's not so much about the word, it's also a lot about cultural parity. Um, and I think that this, this obsession with cultural parity, which is completely understandable, um, is harmful if it is extended or if it leads us to bend or to, <laughs> to the, if it leads us to the necessity to, of finding an equivalent for everything. Maybe we find something much more interesting in China. So that's what I, I hope sort of to go tentatively in the direction next week to say well maybe china is much more interesting we, it doesn't matter what we call it but there's actually ways of you know deciding a dispute that can be done without any of these theorizing without calling it logic and that might be more enlightening to us so so it's not that i um that i don't understand where you're coming from and i i of course i'm all for expanding the concepts but um maybe that's also a danger because it leads us to finding equivalents where perhaps we shouldn't look for equivalents, but rather for other things. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. And I think there's a question in the chat from Samira. Um, he yeah, says, I can't see the chat. Can you read it out for me? Oh, I yeah, I'll read it. Uh, he says, um, thank you for this rich presentation. When you read ancient Chinese texts um, or even um, younger texts, how do you deal with inferences caused by your your present knowledge? Do you actively cancel out what you already know about logic when um, combing through Chinese texts, searching for traces of an uh, inherent system? Yeah. No, of course, I, I do try that. I do try to wreck it. Of course, I can never completely do it. Um, but I do, first of all, sort of try to understand texts um, on their own terms. Then I look into a lot of commentaries. And what I'm mainly working with, so it's not so much that I'm interested in what is actually in the Mo Jing. I'm sure it's a very rich text, but there's experts for it that know much better than me um, how to decipher that. What I'm looking at is how the Mo Jing has been understood in this one realm as logic. Of course, other people do that for the philosophy of language. Still other people find the same passages as basically incarnations of early thoughts on grammar. Um, and I find that all problematic and I try to be transparent about it. And so to, to trace how these interpretations that are very diverse, how they come about. And so I, I bracket as much as I can what I have, I will clearly not be able to do that, but at least I, I, I try also to reflect on what I'm bringing to the text that might not be there. Hey, uh, thank you. And there's a question from Benjamin Gallant as well. He says, uh, thank you for the fascinating talk, Professor Kurtz. I was struck by your remark about how no one who did not already believe in God would want to devote themselves to learning a thousand technical terms in order to understand a translated logical treatise. Could you please say a bit more about 
um, arguably irrational reasons for emphasizing the importance of the study of logic in the West? <laughs> that's a very good question. I, I, that's exactly what I hoped I would get as a reaction. So, so maybe this idea, of course, the study of logic can be a good exercise, but so is the Bhagavan, right? I mean, it's an exercise sort of to discipline thought and to, to uh, give it a, a certain um, um, strictness um, and a certain shape. Um, so I'm all for that. What goes beyond that? Well, we don't know. So I looked a lot into these Jesuit textbooks and in Jesuit textbooks or in Jesuit debates, you basically, so you defend a certain claim about um, the exegesis of the Bible, for instance, and you do so by um, citing or, or pointing to the third rule of the syllogism. And you say, and therefore it's justified. Well, how do you defend it without pointing to that thing? Does that alter the practice? So it's exactly that question that interests me. Why or is theory so important for that? It may be as an exercise of thought, but then there's many other exercises like the Bhagavan who can do exactly the same thing. They help you to, to I don't know, discipline your own thought, to tame the monkey of the mind as the CUG would say. Um, and then what, what logic does specifically, I'm not too sure. Thank you. And um, I think Ryan Nichols has his hand up. So Ryan, if you want to unmute yourself and feel free to ask your question. Thank you. What a treat to attend the lecture. Um, I'm really happy to have learned from you. Um, my question is kind of a, a follow-up maybe to Mariana's question. Um, <clears throat> the, the terminology is kind of diffuse and difficult to, to match across cultures. So I, in my own uh, work, I've tried to reframe the issue about like cognitive norms, um, inclusive of logic. I'm just, my question is, um, <clears throat> if we were to do that, then um, would you would you be able to give us some opinion about whether the cognitive norms are significantly different in the case of Chinese logic, uh, especially ancient Chinese logic, as opposed to um, ancient Aristotelian logic? So I'm thinking in, in Aristotle, you know, we have very clear rules of inference. Um, we have the square of opposition. We have a categorization of very particular propositions, and um, and not only that, but it's this is used like the like the rules of inference that Aristotle presents are used very often and you know when I'm when I think about like like the examples from traditional Chinese medicine and the ancient world or the Yi Jing or even things like the Analects um, I suppose I'm in a position of, of having this opinion that it doesn't seem as though the 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 standard rules of inference are that you know like modus tollens, modus ponens, uh, um, uh, and introduction? These kinds of things um, are are very frequently applied, um, suggesting maybe Chinese. There is Chinese logic, of course. That's not in debate. There is Chinese philosophy, not in debate. But the kind of norms um, are quite different. They play out differently. Uh, could you share some thoughts about that, please? Yes, thanks. It's a great question. So, um, Zhang Shijiao in this book that I think someone should write a PhD on, um, found equivalence for everything, modus ponens, modus tollens. Um, he didn't say, and you also didn't say, that they were applied regularly by everyone and that they were the standards that were always applied. And so this is exactly the, the, the stuff that Ari Levine and, and Martin Hoffman and I sort of were, were hunting for later, that we look into actual practices of argumentation and see what their counts as a valid statement could be an analogy, a historical analogy. It could be a certain style of writing. It could be a certain way of doing it. So clearly um, what you call cognitive norms or epistemic ideals or epistemic values um, change over time. Um, what I would warn against is to say, um, you know, here's what happens in Aristotelian logic. Here's what happens in Moist logic or in the Gongsun Long or in other places. And therefore the two cultures are differently. One, because what happened in Mo Jing and the Gongsun Long didn't have an, an impact. The texts were forgotten. There's no rules and the rules didn't survive. That was gone. So, so we don't, don't have that. Um, and so what we should rather look into it, I, I, I'll sketch some ways of, of doing that next week uh, or, or in two weeks, is sort of how did people argue? What were the implicit standards that they mobilized and that they believed were intersubjectively shared by other people? And so by doing that and creating an inventory of different forms of reasoning in different realms of discourse. So it might be different in historiographical discourse where you cite an historical analogy from um, a, a text on anatomy or, or something else. And I think we just have to try and, and sort of 
complete this inventory of argumentative practices. And then we can go back and see what the implicit cognitive norms or epistemic ideals were. And I think that's a very valuable enterprise. So that's exactly what I think we need to do in order also to unsettle this idea that without an organon of Aristotelian proportions, people cannot think straight. Because clearly everyone who read anything in any realm of Chinese discourse knows that they could argue all the time about contradictions, about you know unwarranted generalizations, uh, about certain misreadings of text and all that. Clearly it was done. But I don't know if that, that's what you were looking for as an answer. May I follow up that? Uh, sure. Yes, please. Um, yeah, that's just, I'll look forward to your lecture um, uh, on those, some of those topics. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's just more productive to find out um, how these things play out rather than use often like a priori defined terms to have conversations about parity. Um, um, I guess from my own point of view, I'm really interested in the underlying causes of cognitive differences. So, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard of Thomas Talhelm's race theory of culture. Um, so this might be at play in helping us understand how people have come to think differently. Um, and there's also just really fascinating cross-cultural psychological work. I know this is quite a leap um, in time, but still um, fascinating cross-cultural psychological work suggesting that there are different um, default inference patterns across cultures. Um, and one of the, I can throw a reference into the chat. Um, <clears throat> enough for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'll be very tentative in next week because we just started doing this and I'm not quite sure where we're going. So next week, I'll, I'll solicit, I, I hope to be able to get a lot more ideas of where we should go. i just give you some examples of what we've, we've started to do. Um, about these things, whether, um, I, I wonder if cultures are the right units of comparison there. I think even within China, so if the, the, it's not necessarily the case that um, argumentative patterns are shared across discursive realms. Clearly there are um, different ones. Um, but even there, there's a great diversity and it changes over time. So maybe the, I, I'm a bit skeptical of, of larger macro level, but that's because I, I'm, I was trained as a micro historian, so I can't get out of my skin. So perhaps you're right. Thanks very much. And we've just got time for one more question. So um, I see Professor Defaul is here. So if you would like to unmute yourself, um, yeah, feel free to go ahead. Hello. Yes. Well, if there is somebody else, uh, hello, everybody. If somebody else wants to ask you a question, I think I should uh, run because I just came in 10 minutes ago and I did not follow the talk. So is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? No? Wait. Seems well, hello, not. everybody. And hello, Joachim and Hi. everybody. I'm uh, yeah. I just saw ten minutes ago that you were giving a talk, so I just popped in, and I just wanted to continue on uh, Mariana's question. You know, she says maybe we are. I mean, asking whether the others have what we have. Maybe I'm I'm translating your question, Mariana, in a way that I would ask it. Maybe not the way you ask it, but asking whether others have what we have. Maybe this is a. I mean, you can ask this. It's okay, but it's maybe a rather a biased and not necessarily the only way of approaching the issue. And I thought, you know, to, to begin with, you assume that we know what is logic and that we agree on what is logic and that we know what is philosophy and that we agree on what is philosophy. So that's why I think I would even go further than Mariana and say, you know, you seem to interpret her comments in the sense of, you know, it's only a matter of speech, it's a matter of wording, you know, we can just broaden the term and then we all have philosophy, we all have logic, but I'm not sure that this is what she meant. I would rather say that if you take her argument a step further, the way I would do it, maybe rather than asking whether the others have what we have, another interesting way of debate, which I think is predominant in China, and of course, to some extent everywhere here also, it's just debating on what we call philosophy or what we call something else. I mean, there was there are so many debates in China in the early Chinese texts on you know what you weigh something, and sure. there you know it's it's a notion that is shared and appreciated, and then the the, the core of the debate is you know 
what is it that you will call this? What, what does it mean? And this is not a step, you know, a pre preliminary step towards the real debate. Do the others have what we have? No, this is the debate. So I was wondering if you if you take Mariana's uh, your point a step further, you know, what we call things and what terms mean is the debate. Um, um, I think I give you the same answer that I gave her, and I mean, no. Um, so, and I don't mean that facetiously. I, I think, so first of all, it's not me who claims that ancient, that I know what logic is. Um, it's the people that I read in the early 20th century who claim to know what logic is um, and who apply it to classical Chinese text. So it's their claim. It's not my claim. I trace the claim. And I will, I, what I try to understand is how it came about and, and what it does to ancient Chinese texts. So my initial enterprise when, when writing this thing was, was basically sort of to, to try and save the ancient Chinese texts from the distortions that were brought by modern interpreters, especially Chinese interpreters, to them. So I tried to, to avoid that. No, no, she's, oh no, she's still there. Um, so I tried to do that. Um, then, of course, th there's different ways of going on about that. So I, I'm totally with you that Chinese debates sort of are very interesting about how to weigh something, so how to what to call something. But from my my innocent um, understanding, that's problems of semantics, and they have a philosophical significance and all that. Um, and what I'm interested in, how or why someone would want to call that logic and say, well, this is the core of Chinese logic. It's not me doing that, it's them doing that. And I observe and I try to find out why it's necessary, right? So it's not that I deny the claim or that I deny the interest of these ancient texts, not at all. I mean, they're, they're very, very interesting, but I get suspicious if I have the same sentence from the Mo Jing, which is the, the, the Meng Ya, the, the sprouts of Chinese grammar, the sprouts of Chinese philosophy of language and the sprouts of Chinese logic all at the same time. And it's basically 10 characters. And I think that can't not be right. It's not productive to think about it that way, right? And then philosophers like you come along and you tell us what's really in the text. But that's not that's not my um, construction site, as they say in German. Yeah, of course, I would not follow Chinese debates on what is logic. I would follow, mm -hmm. you know, look what is an important notion in the West, philosophy, and then look at the debates of what people call philosophy. In China, of course, I would not check what... Uh, debates on what people call logic, but some Chinese terms. But the interesting thing is that the people that I studied, they didn't want to use Chinese terms. They were insisting. And I think they had partly good reasons for that because they yeah. said, well, you know, we're not aliens. Well, we, we participate in a universal enterprise. That's at least what the earliest generation did. And we have something to, tr to contribute to it too. And then others came, no, no, we, it's ours is completely different. And so there's a debate within China and also beyond China, because it's also a global debate mm -hmm. uh, of what is acceptable and not. And so, so I'm very agnostic about many of these things. I don't prescribe any notion of logic. I don't police the boundaries um, of the discipline. I'm just interested in what people do with these terms. So I look into what, you know, into their speech acts and stuff. Okay, well, thank you very much. That is that is all we have time for today. So thank you very much, Professor Kurtz, for a fabulous thank talk. Um, we look forward to your next talk, which will be taking place on February the eighth at the same time, five p.m. CET, uh, toward a Chinese uh, towards a history of Chinese cultures of reasoning. Um, this lecture has been recorded, and so um, we're hoping it, it may be accessible on our website. Um, after this for those who, who didn't have an opportunity to see it. Um, and you can also send uh, questions um, about today's lecture to uh, the Methods in Sinology team um, or visit our Twitter at InSinology. So thank you very much for coming and we look forward to welcoming you back again next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.